Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Prof. Verne and this is Victoria 3's Dev Diary number 8. Today we'll be talking about institutions. Now, there is a bit of a difference today and in the weeks going forward. As you can see, this is not in the forums. This is uh, in a document that I prepared in particular so that I could do it. I got early access to this Dev Diary. I read through it. I thought about it a lot. I Seriously, I considered what I wanted to say about it, whether I could, uh, you know, for example, up the quality of my commentary, bring uh, more things to the light that aren't usually considered when this sort of thing is covered, including by me, of course. So I hope that uh, me getting early access basically will be able, in the future should I keep getting early access, uh, making it so that I can have a better understanding of what we're talking about since I was able to think about it for longer and to make a better case for it. Now that does also mean, of course, that I will not be able to cover the uh, questions and answers of the devs in the video that the Dev Diary came out on, so in the same week. But I will simply make it so that starting in the next week, so in the next week what we will do in the Dev Diary video for Victoria 3, on uh, in the latter half, we will have the actual Dev Diary. In the first half, I will be talking about the developer questions and answers from the forums, about all of them, because so far, whenever I covered that, I could only cover the questions and answers that they had left when I started doing my video, right? Uh, that will change now. I can cover every single one of them, and for the first time in my Victoria 3 coverage, I will also be implementing into the video. I will be discussing it. I will uh, be making the case for you, or rather with you, if you make a better case than me. I will showcase that, of course, as well, uh, and say, hey, maybe I was wrong in that mechanic, for example. Uh, we will We'll cover so both the dev comments in full and the YouTube comments and in, in full going forward. So we cover a dev diary, then next week we talk about his questions and answers, then we cover the new dev diary, and then so on and so forth. Now today's institutions, this was one that I was excited for because uh the laws were interesting to look at in the last Dev Diary. They basically made it so that we got a bit of insight in how society reacts to you wanting to pass laws and to you having passed laws. We saw that there's a modifier, for example, that pe pe uh, people are angrier. If you just recently passed a law that they disagree with, that anger will slowly fade and go to the base level of the anger that they have as the faction that they are. Uh, all of that was covered in the last Dev Diary, but what I was missing was fully understanding what those laws actually do. And the reason for that is that what they do is covered in the institutions. While the laws are very important when it comes to the societal discourse and how your parliament, if you have a parliament, behaves, how your interest groups behave and how your pops behave, how they feel about the government, what we have with institutions is basically how those laws are actually implemented. Now, let's start reading here and you will see what I mean. The institutions are the services that your government provides to its pops. And I use scare quotes here because while that does certainly include the uh, things like schools and workplace safety controls, so positive things, it also means conscription offices, militarized police and poorhouses, so... Uh, maybe not so positive things. The laws that bring an institution into existence also govern what side effects they have, and interest groups will care a lot about those. So basically, when I have religious schools as a law, I can have no funding for it, meaning I would have, let's say, level 0 or level 1 institution funding, and they barely do anything. If I have institution funding two or three for these institutions, so for the schooling system and for the education system, then that will mean that the religious law will actually have a way bigger impact than if we, you know, had just minimized funding. Uh, that is interesting, because if you think about it, and this honestly, and I might be really slow here, I want to I wanna stress this, but I didn't see this at first when I looked at this. I was like, I don't know how I feel about this, but basically, what these institutions are, are sliders. They're not sliders, I, I realize this, when we're gonna look at them, they're not sliders. But they are basically sliders. When we think about Victoria 2, we had laws such as, for example, healthcare, you had different, different variations, and most of the time, and this is something that we can, I think, hold against Victoria 2, but that is also a very old design philosophy that is a bit, uh, it's done basically, I think, in game design. Uh, you just had levels, and certain levels simply were purely better than other levels of that law. Now, we know now that this is different here. We have religious schools, we have secular schools, we have, uh, you know, nobility schools, I think, something like that anyway. Anyway, not all laws are better than the laws that came before them, but the funding can be. And sometimes, if you pass a law that you actually don't agree with, you don't want that influencing your society, let's say religious schools, you can simply push down the institutional uh, level and then once you pass a law that changes it so that it's secular schools, you can push it up again, right? So that is basically how this works. It takes the Victoria 2 dynamic where you had laws and then you had a slider for funding. It takes that and pushes that into a bit more of a... There's not just a, a, an optimal choice here. 
there's there's many many choices that you can make many positives many negatives attached to each choice and they uh, interact on the level of the law plus the institution that's basically what these are they are effectively sliders with fewer trap options we're going to get to the topic of trap options yet again i've talked about this in the past already but we just can't i, I can't stop beating this dead horse okay we're going to talk about that once we get to the actual institution levels now bureaucracy is what finances your institutions we already talked about bureaucracy in the capacities. Bureaucracy comes from government administration buildings which employ clerks and bureaucrats that consume paper and later on other goods like telephones in the process. Uh, the more government administration buildings you have, the more and larger institutions you can operate at once. Running a positive bureaucracy balance is great for remaining responsive to your people's evolving needs. In the meantime, any excess bureaucracy will be used to marginally improve construction efforts around your country. The cost of institutions, or the cost of one level of an institution, is dependent on the size of the population across your incorporated states. An important aspect of institutions is that the effects and benefits they apply only affect incorporated parts of your country. If you have any colonial frontiers, contested territory, or recently annexed land you haven't incorporated yet, these do not pay taxes to you, nor do they cost you bureaucracy, but they also can't access your awesome hospitals. Now, there's a lot in here. Let's start with bureaucracy. We've already talked about bureaucracy as a, a measure of administration, and I, or rather, a measure as a capacity. So instead of having resource pools of abstracted resources like we have them in EU4 with military administration and diplomacy, what we, and is, is there a fourth one? Honestly, there might be a fourth one in it. I, I can never remember. What we have here is, in this case, bureaucracy, which is a capacity. So you can't save up bureaucracy uh, if you have an excess. In this case, it goes to building, uh, being faster. But beyond that, you can't save it up. And that is, of course, more fluid. This is more responsive to the state of your genuine country at that point, rather than you saving something up in the good times and then just going, I'm going to spend that when we have it as us. I'm going to suppress rebels, for example, if they ever come up, right? So this is a better concept, but it is, and I think this is uh, objectively true, it is not very exciting to say, I'm going to go and invest 22 bureaucracy into my governance, right? It's not exciting. It, it's, it's just not exciting. Now, the thing about this is, um, abstract mechanics are necessary for any game, but also in particular for a grand strategy game. Uh, there are ways to do it the right way, and there are ways to do it the wrong way. I think once you detach it far, far too much from a certain thing, and let's not even do the mana debate again, we, we had that already, it doesn't really matter uh, which term you apply. Mostly, I think, where it comes from is, is it fun and relatable? which is a really weird way of describing a grand strategy game. Is it fun and relatable to paint the map? What I mean is, is it fun and relatable what you do? Now, uh, when you, it comes, for example, to EU4, I don't find it very fun or relatable to be like, my advisor gives me three bird, and with that bird, I can then do that, build some ships, right? I'm like, how does that happen? Why does that happen? I don't, I, it doesn't really feel right. Now, the most direct way to do that is usually via money. Victoria 2 did that. Everything was done via money, except a bunch of things. I mean, now that I think about it, uh, everything when it comes to sphering, for example, was basically done via mana points, but don't worry about it, okay? Where I'm coming from is primarily, is bureaucracy something that feels fulfilling when you invest it in, into an institution? And honestly, if you look behind it, the answer is yes. I personally struggled with this, I thought about this a bit. And what I actually like, if we look at bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy, is the fact that bureaucracy is really just the abstraction of me using people and then having those people work. It wasn't the case in Victoria 2, Victoria 2 was different, you needed to have bureaucrats, for example, in a state, they would then bring up the state, uh, uh, administration efficiency, but all of that was just, you just moved a, sli a slider all the way to the right in your budget screen, and that was what you did. Maybe you moved a national focus, of course, was one of the big things or is one of the big things that you need to do. You need to make it so that you have 100% efficiency everywhere so that you get all the taxes and so on and so forth. Not very exciting. And I think it doesn't, you know, really reflect reality either. Uh, on the other hand, here we have bureaucracy, which fair enough, doesn't sound exciting to me, but it is generated from those people working in government buildings with the help of resources such as, you know, paper, such as telephones and so on and so forth. And that is actually fun and relatable. I mean, fun, okay, it depends on whether you're a <laughs> bureaucracy nerd, okay? But uh, basically, it is relatable. It makes sense where bureaucracy comes from. It is completely understandable, and that it maintains the institutions that we run is also understandable. So I actually want to make a case here, I just made my case, I guess, for bureaucracy. Now, let's move on and actually talk about the topic of incorporated states, because this is one where I'm not certain, where I, you know, I, I like the idea of bureaucracy, but I think that saying 
that if you have bureaucracy in excess, all of your incorporated states will have perfect administrative efficiency, that doesn't make sense to me. Let's say I am Germany, I don't know, we were just, or let's say I am Prussia, uh, the Silesian weavers, very unhappy about my current policies, they are rebelling, they rise up, they do things, right? Could I really get 100% of the taxable potential of that location? Could I really get 100% of the potential recruits for my army's conscription service? I don't think so. It is not mentioned here, but I very, very much hope. Because otherwise it will be disappointing. I will actually ask, ask Wiz this on Twitter. Could I really go and do that? The answer is no. And what I hope is that once we get to talk about territory, so about states, that we will basically be told that there are state modifiers that then apply to the effect that the administrative efficiency, in this case, the bureaucracy excess, or, you know, if you don't have a surplus, the, the negative, that will be impacted by that, that will be impacted by local events, and so on and so forth. I really, really hope that that is the case. Because right now, if you think about this, from what we have seen so far, and again, I'm, I'm saying there is a way to amend this by simply having modifiers on a provincial level, but if you think about it right now, you could have a province that hates your guts. It might be incorporated, but they are all a different culture, different religion, they hate you. But if there are enough people in a government agency somewhere in the world, all of a sudden, that province that hates you so much runs smooth like butter. That can't be right. I, I really hope that there is a province modifier. I just want to bring that up because this is something that, after thinking about it, it's not bureaucracy itself that makes me frustrated about this mechanic. Rather, it's the idea that bureaucracy makes your entire state run like, like there's no problem. Even if some parts of that state might hate you and even if you might hate some parts of that state. Um, yeah, what I do like is the fact that Colonial Frontiers contest the territory, recently annexed land, and uh, colonies that aren't yet incorporated don't actually take any. I like that angle because it makes it so, obviously, you don't want the taxes from there. You want the resources, and let's say if you're a slaving country, you want the manpower from there. That is what you came for there. You're not there to make that as your tax base. That's not how it worked in that time period, so I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I like that a lot. Um, again, I just hope that there are modifiers for incorporated states. Now, what we have here makes a lot of sense. We've already seen this before. You can see the construction speed rises with the excess bureaucracy. I'll be honest with you, 4% construction speed is uh, pretty negligible. Doesn't impress. It doesn't sound impressive, but I have to assume most of the time you would be positive in your balance because you want to push another institution through. Right here, we can see it as well. 1.98 million pops generate minus 59 in bureaucracy. This is, uh, I believe, per week. And then we have three institutions. We have education, law enforcement, and the health system. The education system is one that is minus 68 because it is uh, uh, level three. Now, the levels are actually always the same, and they are based on the efficiency of your bureaucracy. We're going to see that in a second. And your population. So 1.98 million modified by something makes minus 22. So it starts at 1.98, goes up to minus 22. And I have to assume that minus 68 is just a result of the game not telling us about decimals, right? So this would be minus 22.xxx. And then together that makes minus 68 if you, you know, multiply it by three. Now, um, ways of decreasing the cost of providing institutions to your people include passing laws to decentralize your bureaucracy with, unelec uh, with elected rather than appointed officials. We can see that right here, hereditary bureaucrats plus 15%. So we go from 19.8 base cost to 22.8. And there's the decimal point. So yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. They, they could show the decimal here, whatever. Society inventions like behaviorism that provide insight into people management, of course, makes sense. That's just uh, basically science. Refraining from incorporating colonies and conquered territories, as mentioned before, also makes sense. And then sending a whole bunch of people to their deaths in terrible wars. Well, yeah, if you have fewer people in your population, it's going to be cheaper, but there will be side effects, right? So with that being said, bureaucracy... As unattractive as it seemed to me at first, especially with the idea that institutions will very much directly impa uh, impact your gameplay and your population, bureaucracy, I think, makes much, much more sense than anything that we've seen in Victoria 2, because Victoria 2 simply goes via money. Your bureaucrats just take money and make bureaucracy, and that's what they do. This is more complex, I like it better. Again, the state modifiers do worry me. Now, when it comes to inst uh, institutions, what do we have? We have the school system, the health system, police, workplace safety, social security, home affairs, conscription, and colonial affairs. Um, I think very fair so far. 
Are there any that you are missing off this list? Because I personally, I mean, uh, basically what we have, right? We have a uh, free speech and whatnot, but that is a law. We don't need an institution for that. Uh, but if you want to enforce something but free speech, you would, for example, need the police, you know, that sort of stuff. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Maybe home affairs as well. Uh, that comes into play if you have a law that modifies this institution, but it is covered in this institution already, right? So if you're missing something here, uh, do let me know. But I think most of the things that I can personally think of are basically covered in laws and are then funneled into these institutions. Uh, now, this is interesting to me. The effects of turmoil are decreased by the police. So I am thinking maybe what I was talking about earlier is already integrated with the provinces, right? I hope so, at the very least, as mentioned before. To establish these institutions, you have, uh, you have to have sufficient bureaucracy for their operation and then enact an enabling law. There are always several different laws that enable a certain institution and which you choose will flavor the institution accordingly. For example, the Colonial Affairs Institution will generate colonial growth in all your established colonies in relation to the size of your incorporated population by encouraging people to move and invest there. But if you have the colonial resettlement law, each level of it will also provide increased colonial migration, uh, migration pull to entice your population to move there, while the colonial exploitation law will increase the throughput of colonial industries while reducing the standard of living of pops who live there. Very long sentences. Anyway, I hope this makes sense. It, it makes a lot of sense to me personally. Um, I like this approach a lot. We can see it here as well. This is Switzerland. Uh, they have a level three religious school. So basically what we have right here is that the general education system is well funded, but the actual law is the religious school system. And that makes it so that we get plus 60% to conversion and plus 60%, that is, that is a lot, plus 60% devout political strength. Isn't that crazy? So if you have a, an interest group that is interested in uh, being devout, you know, that, that has that interest. But if you have a population that is interested in that, they will gain massive, massive political strength if you finance them. It makes a lot of sense. This is a direct way, other than just their economic well-being, of influencing who has power in your society and who wants to have power in your society, right? Uh, it makes a lot of sense. We can see it here with a 10% landowner strength as well. Now, this one isn't as strong as 60% devout because level one here would be 20%. It's basically half of that, but still pretty good. And then here we have state penalties from turmoil. You know what? I, You know, I, th I think we got it. The, the big case I made earlier. I, I will still tweet him. I still want to find out whether this is exactly what I'm thinking about, that this will influence basically how the... Uh, uh, the administration is in a state, if there is turmoil, there may be other things as well, natural, cata uh, natural catastrophes, for example, right? It doesn't have to be political turmoil, but this is very, very good. Law enforcement, you can see it right here. Uh, if you have a harsher law enforcement, then I assume this is even heavier, maybe uh, espionage, if there is such a thing as espionage. Maybe espionage can be brought down as well, quite interesting. Then we have over here wealth, uh, mortality is, so this is wealth based. I have to assume this is a private government? A private uh, health insurance thing? Yeah, here we go. Oh, baby. Private health system. L look at this. I like this system, and I think I give I give away basically right now why I like it so much. I read this time and time again. Never quote that they had private health care. They have private health care. How did I know? I just looked at it. It makes sense, right? The effect that we have here is basically the more money you have, the healthier you will be. Uh, I think this is nice, and what we can see right here is as well that it is something that isn't immediately implemented. Right here we can see that level 2 is being implemented, making it so that, you know, uh, if you're rich, then you will be even healthier going forward. And this is something that doesn't from uh, doesn't happen from today to tomorrow. Rather, if you try to go for a new institution, uh, then, you know, you will simply have to go ahead and basically make it so that you actually spend that money. Again, think of this as sliders, but the effect is actually visible. The effect is properly visible. It is shown to you directly how successful you currently are at implementing that and what the direct effect is. Interestingly enough, what we can also see here is that these are actually grayed out. So this one you can definitely pick. This one is also viable to pick, but these are grayed out. I have to assume that is because of who is governing us, uh, the interest groups, uh, whether you know what sort of parliament uh, is going on, what sort of law you have. Uh, you know, so that you can't go higher. Maybe it is also purely tech related, I'm not entirely certain, uh, but I'm sure that this is related to that. The bureaucracy you invest into institutions can be redistributed as needed, but this takes time. For example, if you have a level 3 health system and level 2 home affairs and a per level cost of 142 bureaucracy, you are paying 710 bureaucracy for the privilege which you have to generate from government administration buildings. So your total institutions, the total work that your government 
pours into basically doing its services and existing costs 710 bureaucracy. But if your population grows such that each level costs 173 instead, so just about 30 more, maintaining these levels will cost you 865. Assuming this puts you at a deficit of 155 bureaucracy, you will suffer a pretty hefty tax waste penalty. Again, if you're not efficient, then of course, you know who's going to collect the taxes, which causes a percentage of all taxes collected to never quite make it all the way to your treasury. In response to this disaster, you may be forced to reduce the level of one of these institutions, which will restore your bureaucracy balance to plus 18, while you expand your bureaucracy to be able to regain the lost level. If you took the level from the health system, your pops will suffer reduced health in the inter uh, interim, while if you reduce home affairs, you better hope you have no anarchist bomb throwers lurking around in the shadows. Since institutions expand gradually, uh, restoring a lost level will take some time. So, if possible, it's best to stay ahead of the change and expand your government administration proactively if you experience strong population growth or immigration waves to your incorporated states. So, basically, we have sliders for the funding of an institution. If you don't like an institution but you need to satisfy people, you can basically underfund it. If you like an institution and you want to keep it going, you want to put that in there, then this is basically a slider with five positions, right? Now, you might say that sliders are better. Um, we talked about this ages ago. Now, you don't have to agree with me just to clarify that, of course, but we talked about this a, a while ago, that sliders basically are just infinite trap options. In a slider, you will have a position that you want and that is better than others, okay? And that is a guaranteed thing. It, it just happens. There are all of the other positions that are trap options. Taking them will always have you worse off. In this one, that is not true. In this one, you have fewer positions, they have different effects depending on your law. You're in a position where you might say, hey, I want the landowners to have more power, so I'm going to bring this up. But I'm going to bring it up in a way that is understandable when it comes to where the resources go and how much they cost me. Uh, in Victoria 2, again, you move the slider and then look at how much in the negative am I? How much in the <laughs> How much in a negative am I? Can I afford this? Does this work? Right? This will not be the case in Victoria 3. I think from a slider funding mechanic, this is basically a, a big part of a budget because once bureaucracy, once you break it down, it comes to you finding, uh, financing the resources and financing wages, finding, uh, financing the education of your bureaucrats that they need to actually be bureaucrats. All of that stuff comes back to money, but it is depicted in a much more straightforward way where you say, hey, we need the resources and we need the manpower. So I like that a lot. I simply hope that these impacts here can also be impacted by stateside uh, agitation, stateside natural disasters by, uh, you know, what sort of pops live in a state. Maybe certain uh, things won't reach a pop, you know, certain taxes, of course, won't affect certain classes of uh, the population. I hope that all of that is sort of implemented on the state side. Now, with all of that being said, this is the dev diary. Yeah, here we are. This is it. What do you think about it? What do you think about the topics that I talked about when it comes to incorporated states, when it comes to uh, the stateside effect, when it comes to the difference between this and Victoria 2's laws and then the funding of the laws? Because again, I personally believe that institutions effectively are your budget. They are your budget and framing that as bureaucracy makes sense because the bureaucracy is that actually implements what the budget is for. What do you think about that? Did I make a good case? Did I make a bad case? Um, how do you feel about this being empire-wide? Do you share my concern that you need to address this still on a state-by-state -state basis? How do you feel about it? Let me know in the comments. Uh, again, we will talk about the Q&As when it comes to the devs, so their responses in the forums next week on this topic, so stay tuned because it will be brought up there for the moment. I would like to thank the members of the channel, namely the Barons, the Counts and the Dukes. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel. I will see you later. Alligator.